This is episode 106 of your Spiritual Game Plan podcast, and I'm your host, Sherry Fletcher. In episode 105, I introduced myself and gave you a brief summary about my ministry and the passion behind the Your Spiritual Game Plan podcast. If you missed that, I would love it if you would go back after today's episode and get to know me just a little bit better. Change. It happens to all of us. You've invested your time and energy into an important role, sometimes for years, and then suddenly it's time for you to move on. Maybe you've worked hard on a dream, and now your path is taking a new turn, but the dream isn't going with you. Perhaps you've raised your kids, and they've moved on, but now your empty nest is filled with parent care. Maybe you're in the middle of diaper changes and laundry piles. If you find yourself asking questions like, where do I fit in anymore? Am I even relevant? How do I find my purpose now? You are in the right place. This is a show for women in a season of transition. I believe that while your roles in life will change, your purpose is eternal. I'm here to help you understand just how intentionally you were made by a creator with a game plan. Through interviews and inspirational guests, we will discover ways to help you unlock the purpose God placed in you, develop a game plan for your life's calling, and embrace the intentional masterpiece you were created to be. Are you tired of trying to fix problems that are not in your control? Are you tired of trying to help others who won't do what is healthy or helpful for themselves? And are you tired of playing God? If you were like me and you were nodding to all three questions, you're going to love my conversation with Barb Roos. Barb is a popular speaker and author who is passionate about equipping women to win at life with Christ-empowered strength and dignity. She's the author of three books and four Bible studies, including her new release, Surrendered, Letting Go and Living Like Jesus. Barb has struggled with the same questions, and today she will share about her time in the wilderness and the freedom she finds by letting go. Good morning, Barb. I am so glad that you joined us today, and I'm honored to talk to you. I'm out here in Seattle. Where are you joining us from? I am here in Northwestern Ohio on a beautiful, beautiful day. That's right. My daughter lived in um, Kettering, Beaver Creek for a little bit. Yep. So I yep. drove from Seattle. I drove her car from Seattle to Ohio. Woo, that's a long drive, honey. I, that's a long drive. I know. Four books I got in on that one. <laughs> love it. It's not how many miles, how many stops to Chick-fil-A, exactly. not how many bus or audio books. Yes, that's what it was. So that in that way is good. And so um, today we're going to be talking about your study, Surrendered, which I love. Um, but I want to give um, people a little glimpse into your life and about the purpose that has been woven into you. And I like to ask people to look back at some of the earliest moments in their life and see where you can... Um, see where God put that purpose in you from a young age. Can you think of a time? It's actually two very quick ones. Yeah. Uh, the very first one was when I was eight or nine years old. And my mom used to work for the telephone company. And she used to bring home these um, hardcover, jur hardcover journals. And I would start to write in them. I was eight or nine years old. And I would just write about my day. And I thought that everybody wrote in a journal. So from an early age, I just began capturing what I saw in the world in writing. And uh, then in high school, I was 17 years old. Uh, it was right before my senior year. And I went to this, this uh, one week governmental experience called Buckeye Girl State. There were about 1600 girls there. And uh, I actually had won the, uh, the, the top job of being governor. But that night, my very first public speech I ever gave was to a room of a thousand people and the sitting governor of our state was sitting right next to me at the time. And uh, I just remember standing there giving this talk. I was in this really fancy dress 
and um, it seemed like a natural thing for me to do. I mean, I was nervous and, and I was excited and all of those feelings, but it, it seemed to make sense for me. Wow. Yeah, I, I can relate to that for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, so today, yeah. oh, go ahead. It would be years later before any of that would happen, but those are just two memories. Yeah, no, I love that. And it's so important to see, um, you know, that you had that purpose in you from day one. And it's awesome. So you and I are talking at a really rare time in history. And there's so much going on emotionally. And uh, I know for me, being out of control um, is such an anxiety producing time in my life. But I do believe that while we live on this earth, there are going to be many more situations to come that are not going to be planned. And so when I saw your study, um, the, when I first saw the white flag, because I'm a very visual person, I kind of saw it and sighed and thought a kind of, to be honest, the first thing that came was like a defeat. You know, it's like, okay, I'm defeated. But what I love about your study that I think is so much different than other studies on surrendering is that you bring out the point that Jesus himself had to surrender. And so we aren't really... I, we, that we actually are relying on his personal experience through this and not, it's not defeating. It's God saying, I've done this ahead of time. Let me show you how. And um, I wanted to hear a, a background, a little glimpse into your own journey of having to surrender. Well, and I, I love how you frame that up as the setup because we do in our own lives, we think about surrender, that it's failure that the wave the white flag means that we couldn't get done something important. Mm -hmm. But the, the principle of surrender is actually when we realize we don't have the resources, uh, when we realize if we keep going, we could do more damage or accidentally kill something. And there is an alternative that can be life giving for us. So uh, one, my oldest daughter is in the military. And so when they study military science, Surrender is actually the path to life in certain situations, and that's the same for us. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, some of my surrender journeys, a lot of them had to deal with my own personal feelings of I want what I want when I want it. <laughs> and I would try to fix and force solutions. I was a helicopter parent when my kids are small. And so if they had something that was happening in their life, or if I felt like they weren't doing something right, I would try to fix it or try to get them to do things my way. Uh, I remember situations on my job when I worked in the corporate world. I had a way that I thought things should be done. And so I wanted to make sure people did them the way that I wanted to do them. So the part about surrender for me has been God gently allowing me to wear myself out, to freak myself out, to stress myself out, to ruin relationships. Can I get an amen? He let me do yes. all yes. of that. <laughs> and um, till I finally got to the point at which on a beautiful day in uh, March 2002, when I was sitting on my kitchen floor and I tried everything that I could do to fix the situation and I almost walked away from my faith. But on that very precious day, I looked up into, the, into my kitchen ceiling and I just said, God, if it's going to get done, you're going to have to do it. And so that is for me when I started to really understand that surrender isn't giving up and it's not giving in, but giving over to the God who can take care of it. Giving over. That just makes me feel good. <laughs> It's like, okay, someone else knows how to do this. And if you can expand upon that a little bit, because I teach it and live it, but I just love your face right there. Like what about that feels good? It feels um, like the trust fall, you know, it's like, yeah, you mentioned that. It just feels like um, when you've tried and you've tried and you've tried and it's like a parent, God comes and he's like, okay, come here, let me, let me help you do this. And um, I, I have a, a tendency to surrender with stipulations. 
<laughs> like, okay, I'm going to surrender this God, but I, I need you to go. I need it to look like this. So if I give it to you, can you, can you do this with it? And I'll trust you to do it, but I want it done this way. And, you know, there's just so much about this book that, um, this lesson that has made me feel like a deep sigh, a, a, like just exhaling and knowing, you know what, I, someone else has got this. And the person that's got this, you know, a full trust and it just helps take some of that worry away. It just feels so good. It does. Um, it does. Yeah. yeah. And I like how you mentioned in the book, um, one thing that really stuck out to me is like, when we pray, we want to trust God, but we are like, okay, is he going to, like we said, it was stipulation. Is he going to give me a whammy or is he going to bless me? And, um, you know, you, you say, be careful what you wish for, because you might get it. And um, I know this year, <laughs> last October, I chose my word of the year. I don't know if you do that or not, but I chose resilience and yeah. God's like, oh, you asked. Okay. <laughs> yep. He is, he is always faithful to, uh, to help us live up to the word where we need him to show up most. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that encouragement. <laughs> so um, your book, Surrender, has six surrender principles. And the two I really want to focus on are number one and number four. I love number one. Well, I don't love it, but I need it. I'm not in control of others or outcomes. Why is it that we try to control and it's so hard to trust God to take care of us when he promises he's going to do it? Because we, in our own human wisdom, we really are convinced that we know what's best for not just ourselves, but for everyone else. And in fact, Often we think we know what's best for everyone else and we are a hot mess in a handbasket ourselves trying to get people to do what. And uh, I know that God in heaven is like, mm, look at her. She thinks that she can fix other people and she knows she cannot even get herself straight all day long. But there is this thing in us that we want to protect what we love. We want to fix what's broken and we want to get things back on track. Yeah. So we, we do what I call in the Bible study, those shine control loving behaviors. Uh, it is, so the S stands for we, we stonewall or we, we just dig our heels in. The H is we helicopter, we micromanage people hovering over them. The I, we interrupt, whether it's with our words or we interfere with others. The N is naggy. I'll need to explain that. The E is excessive planning or stockpiling. Mm -hmm. So those are just, those capture some of those big control loving behaviors that we apply to others' lives when we're feeling afraid or stressed. And the more we apply those control loving behaviors, like a remote control, we kind of push them at others. What it ends up doing is it not only messes up our relationships, but it does not bring us peace. Yeah. Even when we can control a little bit, we get a little victory, we still don't have peace in that victory because we're thinking of the next time we've got to control. So that's, the, that's where it, this, this is why we've got to deal with our own control loving behaviors because God wants us to have peace, not mm -hmm. us to try to fix others. Oh, yeah. And I only get frustrated when I try to fix. It doesn't work. It doesn't, but it doesn't stop us either, does it? No, oh, I keep trying. It's like you mentioned the children of Israel. I just keep forgetting 15 seconds later. They're like, oh, I just went through the Red Sea, but God doesn't really know what he's doing. <laughs> and that's the part why I love having them as a contrast to Jesus, because I believe that there's something powerful. One of my favorite quotes is, Sometimes the best life experience is other people's experience. So the Israelites are those other people experiences where I can look and go, "Woo! I have done that. I have forgotten that God is going to take care of me every single day, or I have stopped during the, during the pandemic. How many of us 
doubted that God was going to take care of us. And now we have a whole lot of food in our house that we do not want to eat. And a lot of toilet paper. <laughs> you said that, honey. You said that. <laughs> I only have I one package. I only have one package I don't need. Just one. <laughs> yeah, because we do, we do. We forget that God is going to be faithful. And so we try to control. We try to have this insurance against uncertainty. And God is saying, I can take care of you for as long as you need me to. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, um, I bet manna wasn't the best tasting, but it was there. He provided, he supplied, it might not have been the gourmet that they wanted, but it was there. It was, but I, for me, I think that the, um, there, there's part of me, I, when we get to heaven, I kind of want to taste it. I mean, it did say that it tasted a little like honey. Hmm. So but the part that is just amazing to me, when I think about that idea of manna, they did not have paychecks. They did not have a home to store food in. God delivered the food right to them. Mamas did not need to put the kids in the minivan and go get Kroger Click List. God sent the manna <laughs> to them every single day. And I believe that's such a powerful message for us as we reflect on the pandemic that God provides differently for us in hard times, but he shows up relentlessly mm -hmm. and we don't have to slay for it. Because as you notice, God told the Israelites to pick it up for manna for six days and on the, he would provide double for the seventh, that even in hard times, God's children don't need to slave away. Mm. Mm. I love that. Yeah, it's so beautiful. One area that my listeners struggle with um, is um, comparison. I think we all do, but a lot of my listeners really feel that their validation and their purpose is found in a role or a position or a title that they have. And, you know, roles change, transitions change. Um, our, even our role as a mother can change um, and look different. And so when we believe that our our actual purpose is in that role, when that role changes or is gone, then it's like walking through the wilderness and we're like, who am I? Where do I fit in? Um, but then we start, like you mentioned, we start comparing our wildernesses even and what others are going through. Um, and so I love how you take this study through the wilderness and I um, want you to give a description of like, what is the symbol of the wilderness and what is the purpose of going through that wilderness? Well, the wilderness is, a, it is a, it's a metaphor, a spiritual metaphor for a time in life. So really the best example is the pandemic stay at home season. Like that is a universal wilderness for everybody on the planet. It's a season in life where we had little to no control over our circumstances, where everything seemed to have a press pause button, where it was a time of emotional and spiritual confusion as well as there were big things that were at stake. Those are the hallmarks of a wilderness season. So that is what we've all faced. But for many of us, we also have had our own household or personal wilderness seasons running congruent with the pandemic. Uh, when ladies read the Bible study, the surrendered study, they read about my wilderness season that ended six months before the pandemic. I was a wife for 26 years. We had an addiction issue that moved into our household that led to my former spouse no longer wanting to be married. My wilderness part of that was letting go of an identity that I had had for half of my life, an identity I didn't want to let go of. And it was excruciatingly painful. But in the wilderness, I had to look and see who God was and the beauty was I didn't have the distractions of lots of things around me. I was able to focus on God, to listen to his voice so that he could speak to me, not just who he was, who he is, but also that I could hear him as he was saying who I was in him. So that when I was able to step out of that wilderness after 10 long years, I knew who I was in Christ 
that I was God's beautiful, lovable, capable daughter, and that I was worthy of his best. That was a lesson I had to learn in the wilderness. That's all. We're done. <laughs> oh, that is so, that is just so rich. I love that. So why is it then that you think, do you think that, you know, we, we tend to even compare our wildernesses and why, why would we want to, but we still do. I don't understand why. Well, I mean, who that's a question we would love to have Jesus show up and answer. But there is, uh, I think that at the core of many things, especially if we're going to have a sister, like Sherry, can we have a sister conversation with us and the ladies listening? Can we yes. have a real sister? Yes, absolutely. Uh, sometimes, so most of the problem with comparison is a lack of compassion. Mm. That is at the core. So when we are struggling and we are not surrounded by people who are listening to us well, and we do not have this, this fixed understanding of who God is and how much he loves us and cares about us, that lack of compassion that we feel is what leads us to comparison because we're looking to see who's better or worse or why I'm lacking. But when we know who God is, how he feels about us, that we can cast our cares upon us. And then we have sisters who surround us who listen to us, that compassion fills us up. So we don't need to look around to see whose life is better or worse. So that is, um, that is my personal experience and my own input on why I think comparison rages amongst us. That is so true. I, that is so good. I like that a lot. And it changes the outlook of of comparison for me it did um because you just feel like comparison is either judgy or jealous and um no i like that compassion that is really good what are some of the questions we can ask ourselves then to move us from being this remote control um for others outcomes well there are three questions that i had to wrestle with myself and some of that took counseling but the three questions are in the very first week of the surrendered study and they are questions that allow us to go you know what are we at the point at which we are ready and willing to let god step in because here's the thing you can be a control freak a control lover god will let you keep going for as long as you want to that is the truth <laughs> but these questions, the very first question that we can ask ourselves is, are you tired of trying to fix problems that aren't in your control? That's question number one. Question number two, are you trying, tired of trying to help others who won't do what is healthy or helpful for themselves? And number three, are you tired of playing God? Mm -hmm. And so if the answer to those three questions is yes, then that is a beautiful place to invite God. And the thing is, if you're not ready to answer yes, that's okay. You just keep going and keep letting God work because there are some situations that it is hard to let go of. Yeah, yeah, it is true. Those are powerful. I love that. Um, so the, the other principle that I liked, all of them, but I wanted to focus on because it's one that, another one that I don't like, but like. <laughs> number four. So we let, number one, we let go of control. And now we've got to let go of expectations too. Come on, what are you doing? <laughs> that I know, you know, when I'm comparing myself and my purpose with someone else's, I only really, I don't, I'm looking at their results. I'm looking at the end of their wilderness time. I haven't really even looked at what their time in the wilderness was. And I tend to think that if I'm living out the purpose God has placed me in, then I'm not going to, I shouldn't be suffering because I'm actually doing what God told me to do. And so my expectations can get in the way of my trust with God. Um, Truly. And the part that is tough for expectations is that most of what we want are good things. We want things that God blesses. We want healthy children. We want happy marriages. We want stable finances and good jobs, full gas tanks, stuffed cabinets with food. 
those are all very, very good things. But the, the struggle for us is that we believe that, it, that God should deliver them all of the time every day. And that's why I love the story that Jesus tells about the prodigal son, mm. the, the elder brother, because the prodigal son, he realizes that he is, he is just messed up and he comes to his senses. But the elder brother that Jesus talks about, the elder brother gets angry because the father, it makes a big deal about the prodigal, the messed up. And the elder brother is like, I've done everything you've asked me to do. And you have not given me everything that I think that I deserve. And we all, he all of a sudden sounds like American Christianity. And the father's response is, Everything that I have has always been yours. Mm. And that I believe is such a powerful mindset for us to hold on to that even when our lives don't look like how we think they should look, God is saying, you are still my beautiful, valuable, capable daughter. Everything that I have, the inheritance that I have promised you is always yours. And so let go of how you think that it should go and keep your eyes on me. Yes, that is so awesome. Um, there are three things that the ABCs that you talk about, and I love how you um, talk about the mountaintop experiences and here, <laughs> you know, here Jesus was just baptized. Like, and the, you know, I mean, I, when I was baptized, the, the heavens didn't open and in the dove that I could see anyway, I didn't hear um, that. But it seems like as soon as you really uh, make a, a step up with Christ, it, you're all of a sudden led into this wilderness. Um, and so you talk about some ABCs on how, how to survive those wilderness seasons. Yeah, the, very, the ABCs are very, very simple because when we're facing hard seasons in life, we got to keep it simple. So A, <laughs> is always believe that you're loved. Jeremiah 31, three, God says, I love you with an everlasting love. With loving kindness, I've drawn you myself. B is believe that God is for you. Joshua 1, nine says, do not be afraid, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because God is with you wherever you go. Believe that God is for you. And C is challenge yourself to trust God and let go. First Peter 5.7, says, give all of your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. And so those three lessons, I, for me personally, I cling to them so that when I am discouraged or afraid, or I want to get my hands in there, those remind me that I can trust God in circumstances that I can't control. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for joining me today and blessing our listeners with your words, your words that mean and matter and make us feel. I love that. Um, I was reading a post you wrote for Amy Carroll on, um, you know, understanding your writing journey. It was oh, so wonderful. I, I love her. <laughs> Isn't she awesome? Yes. She is. Yeah, awesome. But I just thank you so much for taking the time. And again, um, surrendered, letting go and living like Jesus. It is so wonderful and I love it. And I encourage my listeners to form a group and join this, uh, make a study out of this. It's just so deep. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Sherry, thank you for uh, this wonderful conversation. God bless you, everything that you are doing and everyone that you're serving. Thank you. What wilderness are you going through right now? And what is keeping you from fully surrendering? I would love to hear what takeaways you got from Barb's message. Did you have moments where you just took a deep breath and exhaled? I know I did. If you know someone who is going through a wilderness time and this message would give them hope, please share it. I would love for you to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. In the show notes, you will find information that we discussed today with links to Barb's website, Bible study, and ways to connect with her. You will also find links and ways that you can connect with me. I hope you enjoyed episode 106. 
Please join us for episode 107, where I talk to Chila Muscan on how to find and embrace your unique voice and message.